Hello, welcome. Good afternoon. Thanks for being with us today. We're broadcasting live from Park City, Utah, where I am, Costa Rica, and Alex, you're in Miami? Yes, Miami. In Miami. So again, thanks for the Family Office Insights community joining in with us today. Super happy to have you with us. A uh, big shout out to Ala, my friend, and also um, part of the amphibian uh, enterprise here. And so we're super happy to have amphibian with us today and learn about uh, the fund of funds and the operation and the opportunity it presents. Uh, we're going to make sure that everybody who is on the call today in RSVP can be put in direct contact with the amphibian team. And so you can dig a little deeper if you care to invest in the fund. Uh, we're, or again, super thankful for Paolo. We've been friends for a long time and um, smart, successful, and indicative of what Amphibian is doing as well. So uh, we're going to be recording this and posting it to the Family Office Insights YouTube channel. Uh, and preferably, if you guys want to post it on somewhere on your site so we can drive people there rather to us, we don't need to drive people to our site. And so, again, if you're uh, participating today and you find it of interest and there are others in your community that might also be interested, you're so welcome to put them in direct, direct contact. So uh, with that, thank you again for being with us. Uh, please feel free to post your questions as they come to mind to the chat and the Q&A. We'll get to as many as possible as we have a lot of folks coming on today. So welcome, Todd. Please take it away. Thank you, Arthur. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Todd Vendel here. I'm here with my co-founder, James Hodges as well as our COO, Alex Pereira. We are Amphibian Capital. We are the world's first and only to our knowledge, Ether and Bitcoin denominated crypto hedge fund of funds. So really nice, appreciate you all joining. If you can in the chat, you know, we're calling in from Costa Rica, James and I, we have Alex in Miami as well. I know we got quite a few attendees right now. If you'd mind posting in the chat where you all are dialing in from, it feels like a really, international community and that kind of plays into the the thesis of digital assets you know these these currencies can cross borders these are borderless ways to payments yeah thank you for joining yeah thanks arthur um so if you can please post in the chat where you're dialing in from i don't know if we have the function on to turn on cameras but um, we do like to see one another's faces and if there is an option for you to turn on the camera and you feel so inclined we would love to join and get more of that um person-to-person -person connection. You have joined the Amphibio, Amphibian Capital Digital Assets 2.0 briefing, navigating the institutional era. So for those who pay attention to the news or don't, there's pretty good rhetoric, I would say, around, um, around digital assets recently. Um, earlier this year, there were 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs approved and um, we really feel that this next phase of, of digital assets of cryptocurrencies is the institutional era. And um, another relevant event that is happening in 2024 is the Bitcoin halving, which takes place in April of this year. And, you know, markets typically move in cycles and wherever you believe on that end of the spectrum, the past is sometimes an indication of the future. And historically over the last three halvings, uh, crypto has seen all-time highs within the next 12 to 24 months. So it's typically a bullish sign. Uh, Rick, thank you for calling in from New Orleans and Emily from Mexico. We'll give it one more minute before I hand it over to my co-founder, James Hodges. Uh, James is a Kiwi and mm -hmm. often known to sometimes call him the fire hose because he spews so much information so fast. So bear, bear with us before founding Amphibian. James has an entrepreneurial background. Most recently, he grew a fintech startup from two to 28 million users in a very short amount of time and ran a number of his own private ventures. And then we have Alexandre Pereira. He is a veteran in traditional finance. Most recently, he was the COO of Equities America for HSBC, um, a pretty large bank. So we're thrilled to have Alex joining us and bringing some of those traditional finance risk management and due diligence principles 
that he has from his 20 years in executive leadership at one of the top global banks. And he's helping to bring that to Amphibian. Um, Alex also served as the CTO and the COO of a $240 million crypto quant fund. And um, they were doing extremely well and decided at that time to give to return investors their capital because the risk to reward just wasn't worth it. Um, and then in the meantime, has come back in and is ready to help take Amphibian to this next level of the institutional era. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to James now to kick it off. Cool. Uh, <laughs> hey, everybody. James, James, before you get started, uh, yeah. sorry about that. Todd, I think we have it hardwired not to let the faces come on, so I apologize about that. And, okay. and James, in uh, we share a common lexicon, so aho, uh thanks for being here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, hello everybody. I'd love actually to start, just understand, so I, I spoke at a family office event in Dubai last week. So I'd actually love to understand from this audience who currently has exposure to digital assets. And if you do have exposure, uh, just share if you have Bitcoin or ETH or both exposure. So just put, put in, the, in the chat if you have currently have exposure within your family office portfolio uh, towards digital assets. Uh, and if yes, then put uh, Bitcoin, ETH or, or both. Um, I went to 20 countries last year. We'll be going into a bunch of the data that we're seeing around the institutionalization of digital assets. As we speak, Bitcoin is sitting around 53,500. It's been a very bullish start to the year across markets. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin certainly has had a very bullish start to the year as well. Um, I'll, let Todd, I'll let Todd read the chat out when that comes through. So if you guys keep keep chatting, that would be uh, that would be wonderful. And then I'll kind of get starting. So, yeah, the, the intention, the focus today is last year, I went to 20 countries and four continents, being the leading companies in digital assets. And so there's a large undercurrent that is currently happening in vast centers across the world, whether it's in Dubai, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in North America, uh, where people are starting to realize they're under exposure to digital assets. And the trend around just the way that digital assets are set up, particularly with Bitcoin, with ETH, these trends may be rare in our lifetime. So this was from a, a similar group that we, that we did. 93% um, of that particular audience was a couple of weeks ago. Um, held Bitcoin, ETH, or, or both based on the polling data we did ahead of time. Um, and so the, the thing that we're seeing across the board with digital assets is it seems to be a question of uh, not if, but when. Um, and so this is from one of our larger investors in Infinity Capital. And he said, my mental model is there's essentially infinite money, at least a trillion yet to buy Bitcoin that likely will. It'll come in punctuated chunks. And maybe you're right that we're nearing the end of one such chunk, but it's a global market. And as far as I can see, China is in the midst or maybe just the beginning of major stymie efforts. Middle East countries seem to be getting more and more comfortable and interested in crypto. Their wealth is essentially infinite compared to Bitcoin's market caps. I'm not trying to be trying to time any market trades personally. And so our thesis, and we'll, we'll go into a lot of trends, uh, shortly is simple. At Amphibian Capital, we are highly bullish in for a lot over the next five or 10 years on both Bitcoin and Ethereum. We expect volatility and inefficiency in the market to continue. Our goal is to three to five X number of ETH, Bitcoin and or USD that someone invests through Amphibian. And our current target range that we're targeting is three to 5% net a quarter. And so here's a sample. Uh, this is this is the end of January. Um, but you can see the kind of products we'll be referring to later, where you have the price of Bitcoin at the beta exposure, but then on top of that, you can earn additional alpha. So if you do have Bitcoin or you do hold ETH, uh, being able to grow Bitcoin on Bitcoin or ETH on ETH is a very interesting play. Uh, alternatively, if you uh, a family office that is exploring digital assets, but maybe you don't have the risk appetite for the potential drawdowns and the volatility, our USD market neutral fund may be interesting where you're trading the volatility and creating very consistent yield as uncorrelated to other products. So uh, at the same time, we are very careful with uh, our predictions and we'll go into some of those later today about some different scenarios. This is back in 2020, uh, December of 23, we basically called the, the buy the student sell route uh, 
buy the rumor, sell the news kind of scenario for, for Bitcoin that happened in January. And so we're going to go into three things today. So one is digital assets 2.0, the institutional era. Number two is market dynamics and potential cycles. And number three is custody and solutions. And so of course, any disclaimer, uh, this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. It does not constitute financial investment or legal advice, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we get here? So this is the Amphibian team. You've seen Alex, you've seen Todd, you've seen myself. We have a Vilo. Uh, we've got a number of other teams that will be joining us, uh, team members that will be joining us shortly. We have a couple of quants, uh, back office folks, and some really strong advisors. And so after FTX happened, we built a consortium of the top funds, the top market makers and top prime brokers in digital assets to help mitigate counterparty risk. And so that ecosystem that we've now developed has over 10 billion in AUM. Uh, we personally manage probably around 50 right now. Uh, and we've built an ecosystem of, of these leaders. And so our intention through Amphibian is to be a company with clear values, morals, and integrity, consistent risk-adjusted yield with strong custody and protection. It's a, it's a very important piece for family offices, the kind of clients we work with. Uh, we're getting ready to launch an institutional fund as well, which won't have any major counterparty risk within the digital assets ecosystem. Um, and then we set up Amphibian as a way to repurpose our profits into things we care about and build the future uh, that we want our children to live in. So three sections today, let's get into section number one. So I started in crypto back in 2013. I was very fortunate. I um, ran a conference called Net Finance. And back then they started talking about Bitcoin and blockchain and you know all these things. Uh, now I got the hit actually when I first came down to Costa Rica that Bitcoin was gonna be significant. And so when I came back, I went to invest but it was a little shaky back then and didn't really know a lot of other people doing it. And so I decided not to invest. But at the same time, we had one of our top investors uh, who was doing his PhD and he decided to dive in head first. And he did start investing back then. And now he's got you know, a high eight figure, nine figure digital assets portfolio because he took the time to understand it and be familiar with it and grow three different cycles now. And so trying to find the market is very dangerous but also trying to wait for crypto is just as dangerous if not more dangerous and so that's just something i wanted to, to give a little bit of background so in terms of the areas of digital assets we're kind of approaching what we believe is the fourth era so you have the bitcoin era you have the ethereum area which was in 2015 to 2018 the digital assets 1.0 and now we're going into the institutional era um, bitcoin was up 159 percent last year uh, we've already seen a strong start to 2024. Um, and like Todd said, there's a lot of bullish sentiment out there right now. We personally are looking at a couple of different scenarios, which we'll get into, which will determine if we see Bitcoin really break out from here or if we see a bit of a retest and a rejection. Uh, but we'll get into that in a little bit. And so if you're an institutional investor, and do, do we have- Yeah, your... so right now uh, we've had three answers. Uh, Frank owns both ETH and Bitcoin. We have uh, Steve, Stephen Burnham owns both, but not enough. Um, and then Claudia as well. They, she, the, her, she has invested into Bitwise and holds some tokens privately. So I know we do have some, some, about Frank. some other folks. That was me. Yeah, so I know we have some other folks in there. If you could share, if you do own Ether, Bitcoin, both alts or, or any, um, any alternatives, we'd be keen to know. Great. Well, so, so digital assets has really started to take a leap into the institutional side this year, particularly with some of the release of the ETS, and Todd will be sharing more about that in a second. Um, but you're starting to see ballpark numbers now of 400 to $500 million a day going into Bitcoin right now um, through ETS. It is, is very, very significant. Already within like a week of launching, Bitcoin was the number two commodity ETF in the USA. Uh, you've got Bitcoin halving, you've got Ethereum with its upgrades like EIP4844. Um, other reasons why we, we expect there could be traction this year. Um, and then, you know, Bitcoin now across 14 different currencies has hit an all-time high. So where we are moving into a more scattered uh, world with, you know, risk of inflation in certain currencies where... Um, they're unstable. I was in Turkey uh, last year 
and people were using Bitcoin to pay for goods at the market because the lira was very unstable. And so you're seeing, you're seeing 14 different currencies now where Bitcoin has already gone to an all-time high. And so being an inflation hedge, a store of value, uh, that's one of the use cases of Bitcoin, which we'll get into a little bit later. And then Todd's going to share a little bit shortly about the accessibility and how now you have an entire new type of investor getting into digital assets. So Todd, do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, so James touched on the ETFs and kind of how it opens up the door to traditional investment managers, to RIAs, registered investment advisors, that do have clients that may not have the sophistication to want to manage their own private keys. So um, we have seen quite a bit of investor demand from retail. Uh, the RIA industry is a multi-trillion dollar industry. And just as an example for the flows that we saw into the ETFs, uh, the first three days, there was 10 billion in 10 billion in total volume. So uh, it did 20 times the best performing ETF of last year in a matter of three days. So the the desire is there to get exposure to these asset classes. And um, yeah, total net flows of over a billion. And it has surpassed silver to become the second largest uh, commodity ETF as well. So um, yeah, Bitcoin with over a trillion dollar market cap itself, it's um, quite significant and we think this is just the start so um all right can i can i ask a quick question sure so one uh, would think uh being and in my case un uh not so informed that the numbers that we're talking about and the corresponding limited amount of bitcoin that's available uh would suggest that, you know, how could this be that so much money is being poured into Bitcoin when there's such a limited amount of them? Is it just math, meaning that be, the more people are buying, then the more market cap gets pushed up because of the mining of the Bitcoin? I know it's a little convoluted, but you get my point. It seems like there's so much money, but a limited amount of Bitcoin available. Yeah, that, that's the thing about Bitcoin. Like, you know, I read the other day, someone was like, they don't know if they'll ever see the price of Bitcoin going below 40000 again. You know, I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but you have finite supply. And with Ethereum, you can have like a decrease in a deflationary supply. And so it's really like a store of value. And so the more people, the more access you have to investors. Like we, we have uh, the US that launched, but we haven't even had Hong Kong or Singapore or any of these other countries that have launched ETFs yet. And so this, you know, the type of investor that can invest through the IRA or, you know, just through the ETFs specifically, there's a large number of people that haven't even touched this asset class yet. And to add what James said, there's a finite supply of Bitcoins. Uh, there's a finite supply of Ether that's actually being burned and there's less and less being created. So it's not like the Fed can just go print infinite amounts of, of dollars. Uh, there's there's a finite supply of Bitcoins and an increase in demand. So less supply, more demand is typically or historically by economics done well for the price of the underlying asset. Thanks yeah. for that. For sure. And so the reason why people see, you know, a lot of people like it's speculative. Well, there's truth. There is speculation right now in digital assets. Um, that's why we think the market will continue to be volatile and efficient, which is why we've got the best hedge funds in the world in our, in our basket um, to, to play off that. Um, but, you know, I was in Dubai recently and, you know, they were talking about gold and trying to like how to transfer gold or manage their gold and trying to do that with Bitcoin is, is very, very different. And so with Bitcoin, it can be portable and accessible. It can be divisible highly secure for the most part, unless you, you don't know how to manage your keys or, or you don't use a fund like ours. Uh, there's limited supply. So that's why, you know, there's this notion that Bitcoin started in, you know, 2008, you know, and, and we're already seeing a trillion dollar market cap, what's going to be possible over a long period of time with the, with the finance supply. Um, it's transparent, it's immutable, and you have much lower transaction costs than, than gold. And so uh, it's becoming a very interesting, like I said, hedge, uh, very interesting asset class, um, and something that we're seeing more and more family offices putting part of their portfolio. When I, when I was at a family office event uh, last week, there was an advisor who said, you know, the vast majority of, of their clients have up to 5% of their portfolio in, in Bitcoin, just Bitcoin, not including other uh, family offices. 
So uh, that's Bitcoin. So then in terms of Ethereum, the intention behind Ethereum is, you know, we look at this comparable to how Amazon transformed e-commerce. So Ethereum's smart contracts enable a plethora of decentralized applications that run exactly as programmed without any possibility of downtime, censorship, fraud, or third party interference. And so we see, you know, these two, which are the two largest digital assets, you know, we're very bullish on both of those over a long time horizon. Uh, you know, we don't hit ourselves after we run through many cycles of the potential volatility of them. Um, but over a long period of time, we're just dollar cost averaging and continue to accumulate more Bitcoin, more ETH, and leveraging the different strategies to, to accumulate 12, 15, 20% more ETH Bitcoin uh, USD year on year through those kind of strategies. And so further case for Ethereum is 72% uh, of Ethereum holders have held it for more than a year. And so, like we said, it's, it's there's, there's uh, coins that, that's being burned. So you, it's deflationary. And so you actually have more long-term holders for Ethereum than for Bitcoin. And so we've seen Ethereum had a lot of price action recently. It's around 3150 in this moment. Um, there's a whole bunch of different protocols and things being added to the platform, which is continuing to make it more advantageous. And so uh, digital assets 1.0 versus 2.0, what's, what's really the difference? So first of all, blockchain maturity. So in 1.0, it really was hype speculation, dismissal of regulation. You're now starting to see mature industry native companies uh, sought after by TradFi leaders like, like BlackRock. Um, and we'll, we'll go into the different firms that are now placing their bets on digital assets and the infrastructure behind it. In terms of real world integration, the store of value is the only real use case of product market fit in 1.0. Now you're starting to see real world asset tokenization, securities, commodities, bonds, and Web3 debt adoption in gaming and commerce. Uh, institutional involvement in 1.0, you had a rather lack. Now you're starting to see some of the largest players in finance starting to come into the space. And then lastly, in 1.0, with interoperability and scalability, you had early blockchain networks face challenges in terms of scalability, security, cost, and interoperability. Now you're seeing advanced composable blockchain networks with vast, with fast throughput, cross-chain interloop and reduced cost, and that's continuing to get better. On top of that, you've got this convergence. So last year in SP 500, the top seven uh, of most of the gains were by the Magnificent Seven, a lot of AI-driven stocks. And so the same thing with digital assets is you're now seeing this convergence with uh, digital assets, blockchains, and artificial intelligence. And so digital assets is really used as liquidity. And so the tokens can reduce costs and improve incentives for these different financial transactions. The blockchain is used as the trust layer. And then you've got AI, which is used to amplify these capabilities through advanced automation, machine learning, and also makes the identity value proposition more urgent. So now you've got all three of these converging at the same time, further creating different use cases and options for different protocols and continuing to build out the ecosystem. And so here's a series of companies um, that are now starting to place their bets in digital assets. So 36 trillion AUM from this collection of companies that are playing a variety of different roles within the ecosystem. And I'm happy to send these slides out for my email and after we can email you guys the slides if you desire. And so the question is why are these companies that have 36 trillion assets under management now entering the space? Uh, so one is technology uh, maturation, number two is real world applications, and three is regulatory progress. Todd, do you want to share a little bit about this? Sure, yeah. So um, this is this is a quilt. It's something that BlackRock publishes uh, each and every year, which shows the top performing asset classes. And if you go over the last 10 years, uh, Bitcoin not only has been the top performing cumulative asset class, it also has the highest annualized return. And uh, seven of the 10 years, it was the leader of all of all different asset classes in terms of total performance. So that's signaling, I think, BlackRock by publishing um, by publishing literature like this and posting it to all of their all of their clients. Um, they're serious about about Bitcoin and historically it has performed really well. Great. And so the, really, that's the summary of the four eras of digital assets and just the kind of moment momentum that we've seen happening over time. So the next one is the market dynamics and potential cycles. So this is starting to look at, you know, looking at the numbers is one thing, what's happening in the psychology, 
what are potential scenarios that may possibly play out here? What, what are we looking at? So, you know, for us, we still see digital assets relatively uh, early in the life cycle. And so investing in tech stocks in the early to mid 2000s, you know, may have felt rather challenging as well, but we see this again and again. You know, I think we're seeing an AI right now. We, like I said, last year, we saw a huge explosion. Um, we haven't seen like an AI bubble pop yet. Um, we certainly have seen that in digital assets. And so down the hype cycle, we just see this trend again and again. Um, but within digital assets, we're really starting to see things mature and a lot of institutional players come into the space. Like I said, I was at a family office event in Dubai last week. And then we were with Signum, which is a Swiss bank, uh, where we built a custody solution for institutional investors. And so there's very sophisticated players all around the world gearing up to get into the space. And we're seeing a lot of family offices getting behind that as well. And so like anything, time in the market is costly, right? 52% of the S&P 500's best days were in bear markets. So a lot of people are waiting for digital assets. Um, but the thing is digital assets aren't, aren't waiting for people. And so the, the supply is finite. The longer people wait, historically, like over a longer period of time, uh, the less the returns they would achieve would be. And so the other thing uh, to, to bear witness is when things oftentimes hit mainstream press, it's oftentimes too late, right? So when we saw ETFs being announced earlier this year, uh, price pumped, and then it went from 51K down to 39K. Now we're seeing a new surge as we start to approach towards the halving. Um, back in 2017 cycle, 2021 cycle, by the time we had big news press releases, those are oftentimes top of cycles. And so these are things that we really need to, to factor in. And so why digital assets 2.0, why this era may now be different is because of the type of customer that is now uh, able to invest in the share class. So before you would invest and have it on an exchange, your Bitcoin, or you would have it on a wallet. And so for a lot of people who are like 65, they're probably not gonna do that. Um, but now that you have ETFs and you can go through an IRA or someone else, there's a whole other slew of people who may be willing to invest, plus institutional players, other players may be willing to invest more because they feel safer with these types of instruments. And so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of reason why we're bullish on, on digital assets. And then at the same time, like I said, we're not, we're not gonna be the super crazy hype guys making big price predictions in the short term. This was a letter we wrote to our investors back in December. And historically, the way that these cycles run within Bitcoin is once they hit the all-time high and they you know, you know, they fall back down another 50, 60, 70%, they correct. They historically go into some sort of retracement cycle before heading back down and then going into a new super cycle. And so this, this is back in December, 50 to 55K, which is the, the area that we're in now. Uh, the 786 Fibonacci retracement level is at about 58K. This is kind of the danger zone of Bitcoin that we're seeing right now in the short term. If we, if we blast through these levels, you know, we feel very confident we're going to all-time highs, um, but there could also be a chance here that we get rejected here, you know, go back and retaste, uh, retaste lower levels and then, you know, potentially go off into a new super cycle. And so this is the Bitcoin market cycle model and the stock to flow model. This is how Bitcoin is kind of tracked over time. This is their model. You know, they're very, very bullish. And so they are expecting us to currently, um, you know, go into a, a new all-time high and into a very bullish model. Um, but at the same time, digital assets is highly correlated with the stock market currently. It is a risk asset, right? And so we're seeing NASDAQ, Dow Jones, S&P 500 all hitting record highs. And so we don't know how much longer that kind of roaring stock market is, is going to continue. And so that kind of plays off the thesis of, you know, in the short term, which direction is digital assets going to go? And it's, it's hard for us to predict. Um, but like we said, the only thing we feel highly confident in is that the market's going to continue to be inefficient, continue to be volatile, and if we can accumulate through different strategies, more Bitcoin, more ETH, or more USD over a long period of time, that's the thing that we think about because eventually we, we feel very bullish. You want to share a little about this, Todd? Yeah, just uh, just a moment as well. I did want, I saw a question come in. I'm just going to check that really quick. Um, so an anonymous attendee asked, is Bitcoin risk considering many global conflicts around the world? Um, if you could clarify or retype that question, that'd be helpful. Um, I'm not sure what the exact question would be. 
if Bitcoin is more risky due to global conflicts, I think we would actually argue the other way, um, since there is global conflict and like threats to potentially monetary systems falling down. Um, since Bitcoin is on a blockchain, you can, you know, cross payments across borders. And um, yeah, there's no way that it can be manipulated by by uh, higher powers or financial institutions. So yeah, if you, just quickly on that, I mean, there's two stories, right? Like if risk assets sell off, sure, in the short term, you may expect Bitcoin to sell off. Um, but like I said, you know, 12, about 12 different currencies, Bitcoin has now hit an all time high. And so if you see, you know, larger nations start to go into high, you know, hyperinflation or these kind of scenarios uh, due to geopolitical tension or, or other reasons, uh, that's a further use case for Bitcoin. So um, yeah, there's, there's multiple scenarios. So what what do we need to see for for crypto for digital assets to go to all time highs? Number one is this new class of investors, which we've talked about at length. But now anyone can buy Bitcoin in their in their IRA, which is significant. You know, the seven trillion dollar RIA market. If just one percent of that went into Bitcoin, that's hundreds of millions. Um, the custodian ecosystem is improving as well. So for those that are in crypto or have been following it, they saw the the risks with FTX and uh, and Fabian has helped really drive counterparty solutions to custody assets off exchange and uh, really eliminate exchange exchange risk. And uh, in terms of crypto exchange integration, Citadel and Charles Schwab, among other financial institutions, have actually started to create their own crypto exchange. And then real world asset tokenization, we already have countries throughout the world that are tokenizing their natural resources, that are tokenizing real estate and real world assets or historical monuments. So um, we're really in this institutional area era having having things tracked on the blockchain. Thanks, Tom. So, so then there's potential scenario two, which is what I was referring to earlier, which is uh, Bitcoin retracement levels. So you've got a few different uh, Fibonacci uh, cycles and retracement levels. Uh, you've got the 702 and you've got the 786. Uh, Bitcoin currently has just gone through the 702. We'll see if that's going to be sustainable. Uh, but you've got the 786 right around 58k. So we're in we're in a very kind of danger zone area right now where we're going to see a lot of volatility. Uh, we do have risk. This could be a local top. Uh, we are seeing full 4.236 Fibonacci retracement levels happening across Nasdaq and Spiv 100 Dow Jones. Uh, and so that could be a reason why we may see some sort of like retrace happening in Bitcoin if, if we get rejected up there for the stock market as well. Um, but we have, these are really the key levels, 50 to 55K, maybe slightly higher in Bitcoin, ETH 3,500 to 4K. These are really the levels we're watching at to see if we can break them or we get rejected and then we go off into a, you know, a new cycle. Um, we have to go further down before we go up. And so this is how we saw Bitcoin playing out. This is a, a, a fractal we've been watching very carefully. Uh, this is what we saw when the ETFs were being, uh, you know, just being launched. We got it rejected, um, and then we've seen a similar price up. But now we're starting to deviate from this fractal, and we're starting to go a little further up. So, regardless of the direction that BTC or ETH goes from here, uh, now is a very strong time for volatility, and it's a very strong time for for yield. Uh, any questions? Yep. So one came in from Emily. She asks. Uh, if traditional players are now moving into digital asset tokenization, doesn't that mean that the traditional crypto will die out? And given the interconnectivity of the current players and that many are failing regularly, is there a need for business continuity and operational resilience planning? Boss Alex. Yeah, Alex, um, maybe I'll pass to you uh, on that one. I'm not sure if you can see the questions, Alex, but yeah, what do you think? What do you, uh, how would you respond to that? Yeah, no, I cannot see the questions, but I can, I'll try my best to answer is, um, I think, yes, we do need a better resilience and a better control with the digital assets and between the digital assets 1.0 and the one that we are seeing right now, there was a significant improvement, but it's still, still a long way to go and it's probably going to be also covered on the item three here in this presentation for off exchange settlement products um in terms of traditional crypto and traditional players getting to the crypto space right now i think that there's one fundamental difference between the digital um, assets space and the traditional assets is the pie is not yet finalized so people can actually step into this space create their own tokens and then reconnect and sell uh, um 
Bitcoin, ETH, or use ETH and Bitcoin as a stake, and then this all be like part of a large pie. There's no limitation per se. As long as the coin stop being issued, the value of the assets you're gonna go up, and then it will trigger more and more use case. Um, and I think uh, on the institutional side, I don't think we actually saw the entire flow yet. I, don't, I know that the numbers on DTF is actually very expressive, but coming from the traditional finance uh, and traditional equity background, there are still a lot of other players that will be quote unquote forced to actually participate in those ETFs. So if, if well, as a simple example, if you have a, an ETF, which is basically tracking an index, and because the, the crypto ETF makes such a big volume, if that ETF get included on the index, all the ETFs tracking the index will be forced to trade them as well, which then will become more and more flow into this space. So I think it's a composed um, exercise and then it's moving in the right direction. Um, and with the solution that Amphibian is actually designed and will be presented here on the item tree, give us this level of comfort that we need uh, and the confidence as well that we need to actually put a foot on this space and make sure we don't we don't go through the FTX side effects. Well, pass back to Todd. Yeah, and last thing I'd say on that, Emily, is just doesn't that mean that traditional crypto will die out? The amount of developers that are developing on the Ethereum protocol blockchain is thousands. And for a new token protocol or blockchain to be developed and have the support of it, um, I mean, it's not a zero, it's a non-zero chance, but I'd say it's quite close to zero just because of the communities that have helped prop up these, you know, these software, these blockchains over, it's it's been almost a decade now for, for ETH, I guess. Yeah, close to a decade now, and then Bitcoin's been around longer than that. So that's one last. Yeah, uh, and and I think a lot of these things is this is not actual competition, like tokenizing something in real estate versus uh, investing in Bitcoin is a very different use case. So um, I'm not I'm not seeing them as as competitive. Uh, so the last thing is the custody and solutions. So oftentimes the rest of the digital assets for a family office. Uh, you know, or more sophisticated investors hasn't always made sense. But as the space matures, uh, we're seeing a lot of progress. And so we're seeing a lot more people come into the space. And so historically, people who invest in Bitcoin say, not your keys, not your coins, uh, which basically means you need to keep your Bitcoin safe on a, on a wallet. Um, but, you know, with US dollars, you likely wouldn't just keep it in a bank account at 0% yield. And so this is the opportunity that we're now starting to see as the space emerges is to create really consistent risk adjusted returns alpha on top of your Bitcoin. So if you're holding long Bitcoin, instead of holding a wallet, you can invest in a fund like Amphibian. And then on top of that Bitcoin, you earn an additional yield. Uh, and like I said, our goal over a five or 10 year period is to try a three to five X amount of Bitcoin uh, or ETH that, that someone like that may, may hold. And so you can see here, uh, this is a sample, uh, over since 2019, uh, performer and live. So performer means the underlying funds we invested in, um, but we hadn't got the portfolio live ourselves back in 2019. Um, you can see very smooth, very consistent yield uh, and more bullish years, you are gonna see a higher yield, um, but historically, you know, we're aiming to target 12, 15% a year in years like this, probably a little bit higher just given uh, the volatility in the market. And so the intention of this space is how do you grow Bitcoin on Bitcoin or ETH on ETH or USD on USD? Like if you're concerned about the risks of digital assets, but you're also concerned about the fear of missing out if it does go a lot higher, that's why investing like USD and targeting a yield of maybe 15, 20% a year, um, but very low drawdown may be interesting to you. Or if you already hold Bitcoin or hold ETH and you're not doing anything with it, maybe investing that Bitcoin or ETH into a wallet uh, or into a fund like Amphibian may be really, really interesting. And so with, with a solution like this, it's very uncorrelated to other places, highly liquid, you have a five plus sharp ratio. You have Alex who worked at HSBC building up very uh, rigorous institutional grade risk management solutions, IRM solutions. And you know if a four year cycle continues, you're aiming to target 75 to 100% across a four year uh, growth of Bitcoin on Bitcoin. Um, and counterparty risk has been very minimal average across the last five years. Um, so once you start to diversify, which we can get into later, um, it becomes very, very interesting. We have some questions, do we? Yeah, I was just wondering, since you brought it up, it might be a good time, if you can, to make the case for, uh, I'm a Bitcoin investor, I'm an Ethereum investor, I'm just going to stay long. Um, 
the the idea of that is sort of set it and forget it. And you know, you've talked about a, a lot of things that impact staying long up to this point. So what what are the uh maybe you can articulate some of the advantages of taking your asset that you have now and putting it into amphibian and you know what you can do for someone who's staying along that they couldn't otherwise do for themselves. Great, yeah. So if you're holding Bitcoin or ETH in a wallet, it still has risks, right? You still have a, a very small chance of being hacked or you losing your keys or these other things. So it's, it's not a zero risk. If you're holding in a fund that's professionally managed, uh, the chance of things like that happening is very, very small. In addition, uh, we have now gone through and vetted over 700 different hedge funds in digital asset space. There's about 1,200 in the space, maybe a little bit more. We've gone through our scoring system, eliminated 80% before we've even done diligence on them. And now we've you know, vetted the rest of them, done very rigorous due diligence, built relationships with these top funds in person. Um, and now we've got them all in one portfolio um, that allows you to grow Bitcoin on Bitcoin or ETH on ETH. And so we've got a few slides in a little bit that will kind of explain it. Um, but the intention is instead of holding Bitcoin in the wallet, you just hold it with us. And you can grow more Bitcoin or more ETH or more USD if you don't currently have exposure to digital assets. Um, but it's maybe an asset class you want to have exposure to that's uncorrelated to your other assets. And you don't want to miss potential upside, but you're also uh, a little bit risk adverse and are concerned about potential downside. And so that's why a USD fund may be interesting. So do you have a question there, Arthur? Yeah, maybe uh, a, a little deeper on, you know, I've got, a, uh, you've used a, uh, a um, an example of a 65 year old with a half a million dollars in his wallet with Bitcoin and Ethereum. So what's the risk that he has with that wallet as opposed mm -hmm. to having that half a million dollars in the fund? Can you explain the delta of the risk, you know, what the advantages are? I got help. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um few different, yeah, so comparing it, if you are holding, if you're managing your own keys, it's like uh, there, there often comes a technical or software know-how to be able to manage those keys and those passwords. And we have seen it historically, these dormant wallets where keys or passwords have been lost. So there is significant risk in there and a bit of technical know-how to be able to access your, your tokens at any real time, whereby the delta or the difference with Amphibian is it's one transaction to have this diversified exposure. We manage the keys in a professional manner. We custody the assets off exchange. So there's no exchange risk as well. And on top of that, we grow the amount of tokens that you have by, you know, let's say 12 to 15% per year. So let's say you own hundred Bitcoin and you're keeping them in your keys and you don't lose them. At the end of the year, you still have hundred Bitcoin where with Amphibian, you could potentially have, you know, 115 plus Bitcoin and you don't have to deal with the technical know-how of managing the keys and also the risk of, of losing them as well. Great. Yeah. And then just to uh, go, go ahead. Ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, so last week, like I mentioned, we were with a Swiss bank and we've helped launch the world's first tri-party agreement in digital assets. So in TradFi, uh, when you trade, you don't have counterparty exposure to uh, the trading menu. And digital assets, historically, you have. Now with the solution we've built, your assets will sit in escrow, fully off the balance sheet, bankruptcy remote with a Swiss bank, uh, regulated by Swiss law and protected. Um, if it's in USD, you can have that earning treasury yield. If it's ETH, you can have it staked. If it's Bitcoin, it just sits there. So you can, you can accumulate different yield just by sitting there. And then that gets mirrored onto the exchange. The exchange will take the counterparty risk. They will have a credit. And now you can trade on the trading venue without that counterparty risk. And so our intention this year as a fund is to eliminate 80 to 90% uh, of our counterparty risk through custody solutions like Signum, Copper Clearly, and, and others that um, Clearly has been around for a while, but Signum is, is currently in, in uh, going live as, as we speak. Go ahead, Arthur. Yeah, there's, um, you know, people didn't realize that if they bought gold through, you know, a money center bank that it sat on their balance sheet. And so it was subject to the, the counterparty risk of the, of the bank. So I think that maybe is a good analogy. In this case, you're, you're not subject to whatever the credit worthiness of the balance sheet of the custodian is, your, or bank, 
right? It's probably a similar situation where you're just keeping it totally um, bankruptcy remote or wh whatever the proper term is for that. Is that essentially what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. And the uh, the other thing that um, seems to make sense to me is that I happen to know people, as you might guess, that are really paying attention to all the staking and the way to do the Bitcoin to Bitcoin, Ethereum to Ethereum stuff that's really arcane and complex. And I think even the smartest people that hold assets in their wallet couldn't possibly enter that realm uh, without really doing it day in, day out. So to me, it struck me when you were talking about what the advantages are, is that, you know, the everyday Bitcoin holder or Ethereum holder just can't possibly undertake that project. Is that fair? Yeah, for sure. And we have a consortium of all the top funds and market makers in one place that are actively monitoring everything. And as soon as there's any form of like potential risk, uh, it's being shared in the thread. We're doing diligence and then we're adjusting things accordingly. Have you been able to get the, in, uh, has it been a struggle to get the funds that you interviewed in due diligence to get to the point where they're within the scope of what you need them to be in terms of custody and that sort of thing? Uh, it's a work in progress. I, I think now we're pretty well diversified, but with Signum, so we had 12 of our top funds uh, in Switzerland with us last week. And uh, that, you know, all paperwork's been done, testing's already begun with, with five, five funds. Um, and so we expect this to roll out over the next coming quarters across the portfolio. So um, this, this, is, this is a very significant uh, part of the digital assets ecosystem that hasn't been done before that really protects against counterparty risk. Yeah, great, thanks. And then I think, yeah, yeah. Well, Emily did have one question in the chat related to our business continuity plan. Yes, we have on our VCP. It's in our data room and uh, we can send that to you offline as to not go into it right now. But the answer is yes on the business continuity plan. Thank you, Emily. Cool. So if you are looking at potential allocations, digital assets, there's kind of four buckets that we like to say. One is USD yield, which is probably going to be like a lower risk side. One is blue chip plus yield, which is ETH and Bitcoin plus yield. Another one's liquid venture, another one's liquid long. And so for uh, USD or digital assets hedge fund yield, uh, the reason why this opportunity exists is you have a highly volatile nascent market. Uh, you have a demand for leverage, you have structural inefficiency and you have new innovations. And so there's a bunch of different strategies you can implement and put into a basket, whether it's arbitrage, market making, liquidity providing, DeFi yield farming, you can also do some algo trading, delta neutral, long, short, mean reversion, et cetera. And so we've developed an algorithm through Alex and those quants that take all the daily data, PL data of our underlying funds, put them into a basket, and then create the best risk adjusted uh, returns you know, based on that. We can run tens of thousands of simulations of the best digital assets funds and then create the best possible risk adjusted returns based on that scenario. And that's what allows us to create very smooth, very consistent returns. Um, again and again, five flush up ratio, less than 15.15 correlation to stocks, uh, conservatively targeting 12, 15% a year. Uh, and a year like this, probably 15, 20, 25%. Once we launch our institutional grade fund, you'll be able to see your assets real time, 24 seven. They'll sit in escrow in a Swiss bank. They'll earn treasury yield. And on top of that, you'll earn this market neutral yield. So seeing a lot of interest from family offices all over the world in this product has never been available before, but people are wanting to get exposure to digital assets without the same kind of potential risks or volatility they're seeing in other places. So this is a very interesting hedge, uh, but also you know, a pretty consistent, uh, high-performing strategy um, that a lot of people are very interested in. And so we'll, we'll get close to wrapping here. Uh, I'll, I'll just kind of fire through these, and then if you have any more questions, um, feel free to put questions over here. Um, but if you're going to go into the space, how do you start to think about it, right? Well, for us, this is like any other investment. You create portfolio goals, you identify risks, you source and diligence funds, you mitigate or eliminate the risk, you diversify, you have a dashboard to measure things, and you, you monitor them. And so we can send these slides after, but there's like a whole series of approaches that we do, as you can see, very rigorous approach to thinking about all these different pieces and risks and how they all come together. Um, to create the best risk-adjusted portfolio and the best risk-adjusted returns. And so for us, based on where we are now with the cycle, 
for a consistent yield of Bitcoin with ETH or with USD. This is a very strong time uh, for us in the market. And so the kind of options that you know we offer to people who listen to this and, and who are still here and who are interested is one, you can do the heavy lifting yourself, but if you're running a family office or something else, you've probably got many other things that you probably don't desire to go to this level of scrutiny. You may not also have the connections or the skill set or other things as well. Um, or the other option is, is you have one call with us, go through a diligence process. We have a data room. Um, and you know, our goal is to target three to five X number of Bitcoin ETH yield over the next five or 10 years, um, similar for, for USD. Um, and our current environment target is we're yielding one to 2% in a month. So it's very smooth, very consistent. Um, if you do have a desire to explore, um, you can reach out to me, we can get a call set. Uh, Todd is a financial advisor. Our background was at Merrill Lynch for nine years, has a wealth management practice for the last five years. Um, if you desire to be a bit more technical and you want to bring in Alex from HSBC, uh, HSBC, uh, we can bring him in. Uh, we're getting very close to bringing in our CIO as well um, to continue to grow the fund um, and yeah, offer a really interesting new product set with our institutional fund. So if you're interested in any of those, uh, we're discussing further uh, with the current products. Uh, here's how you get a hold of us. If you have any further questions, please let us know. Great, super helpful. Can, can we talk a little bit about being that we now have an ETF access, the decision one would make saying, okay, I could do this or I could do this. I could buy the ETF or I can invest in Amphibian or similar type. You know, what, what are the things that folks should consider one way or the other? Alex, you want to take that one? Yeah, I do. So, um, very good question, Arthur. I think the ETF is very simple. It's a simple one-to-one -one mapping between a stock product and a spot product on the, on the crypto space. And when you invest in a fund, you have an algorithm trading strategy. Normally, you have an algorithm trading start, uh, strategy underneath, which you generate more alpha on top of the simple spot mapping for that way. So if you just go and buy ETFs, it's the same thing as you go and buy the spot itself. You we won't create the alpha on top. And that's the, the beauty of the work that Amphibia has been doing is enhance this due diligence. We also trace for the funds, which has the right mix between profitability and control and safety when doing these profitabilities, make sure the algorithm is not going completely out of rack. And then they have risk limits and control limits. It's all part of the very detailed due diligence that, that we can send you on the, uh, on the data room. Uh, and that is the competitive advantage comparing Amphibian and a simple ETF is the extra layer of a generation of alpha that we provide throughout the funds. Which was suggesting, is it fair to characterize the ETF as just a long only play? Fundamental. Yeah. It's the same as you buy the spot. It's instead of you having to worry about your private keys, et cetera, et cetera, just go to your broker and then buy the spot. It's a one-to-one -one relationship nothing more so if the asset depreciated on one side it's going to depreciate on the other side there's no risk on the middle to make sure that you are protecting the investment yeah and sim similar to etf gold right so if you do an etf gold just as a parallel it's exactly the same so you don't have to worry about where you're going to use your vote to put the money you just buy the etf but they are correlated one-on-one -on -one with the underlying asset right and you pay up uh, some sort of friction for that ease right exactly uh, the I think the argument could be made based on, can you pull that performance slide back up? Uh, that the, the, the thesis is not just the thesis anymore, it's actually working, right? So through a variety of market cycles with Bitcoin and Ethereum and US, USD, you've actually been able to produce a, uh, a positive rate of return, right? I mean, am I looking at this the right way? Yeah. Oh, that's exactly, exactly the point that said earlier. So um, say you owned 100 Bitcoin at the start of 2023, the additional alpha we generated of 12% is in Bitcoin as well. So you'd have all of the growth from whatever, you know, let's say Bitcoin went from 30 to 50K. That's not accurate, but it went from 30 to 50K and you now have 12 additional Bitcoins on top of that. So you have 112 Bitcoins. You have exposure to the beta, to the price movements like you would get in the ETF. Um, you would just additionally get more Bitcoins, you know, mailbox money um, coming into your account in a risk managed and diversified way. 
Can you, uh, I, we're going to run out of time here, but if I can sneak in one more question. Do you have sure. a, do you have a, a sense of what the impact of the having will be in this case, as opposed to others, will it be the same? Can you give us a little color around that? Yeah, I mean, my, my take is I, I don't know if it would be quite as significant as, as other cycles. Um, like I said, there's kind of two scenarios. We're, we're at retracement levels right now, so this is a very significant level to see if we if we do go bullish and if we see like having a really positive impact or if we actually get rejected here, go back and potentially test like a 40K, a 32K, um, and then potentially go into a new super cycle. So um, this, this is what we're really looking at in terms of in terms of the halving. I, I do expect, you know, we've been through a number of these now, I do expect probably slightly less impact for this one. Yeah. I think one of the most interesting things and significant that you talked about is that, you know, the ETF gave permission to institutional investors and that there are other institutional investors that didn't create the ETFs that were waiting on the sidelines to get the green light or permission of the marketplace to to deploy capital on this and that it'll suck up a lot of capacity, right? Which arguably, if there's only so many Bitcoins, it'll raise all boats, so to speak, right? Yeah, that's that's something the idea. And then Arthur, I don't know if you're referencing JP Morgan because like Jamie Dimon has been a very outspoken <laughs> critic. Yeah. They have, they're doing they're now doing their own thing and may have been doing that in the background over the last, you know, oh. number of months, years. Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. Um very, very helpful information. Um so thanks for doing this, guys. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and we'll make sure everybody uh, gets in touch and 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 so it's easy for them to speak to you about potentially investing in the fund and um and then maybe we can have you back at another time. So we had a bunch of comments. You can see them there too. But we'll put everybody in touch and and uh again thank you. Thank you to the Family Office Insights community for participating today. And as I always say, thank you for spending with us the only thing you can't make more of, and that's your time. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Great. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.